Hey gang, welcome to the Gale Athletics Connections podcast, the show that brings you the men and women of track and field and explores their unique stories. This show is brought to you by Gale Athletics. Head on over to galeathletics.com to find all your track and field equipment needs. I'm your host, Mike Cunningham, National Sales Manager for Gale Athletics. This episode, our guest is Peter Thompson. Peter has, uh, you may not have heard of Peter, and if that is true, then boy, I've got a treat for you because this guy is fascinating. The coaching he has done through 50 plus years of coaching track and field is uh, just astounding and then instrumental in the development of coaching education through USATF, formerly TAC, TAC. Uh, you're really going to enjoy this one. Uh, we've gotten in some audio issues, but I think you can... Uh, push through that and it'll be worth it for you uh, to pay off in the end. So, hey, without further ado, please help me welcome the wise, the wonderful Peter Thompson. Uh, Hey, thanks again for joining us today for the Gill Athletics Connections podcast. One of the values that I get as your host is I get to meet some of the more interesting people that maybe we don't know about and hear about on a uh, current basis. And today is one of those guests. Today, I have Peter Thompson with us. I've gotten to know Peter here for the past couple of days, doing a couple of pre-interviews, and uh, really excited to uh, introduce Peter to you. Uh, Peter, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for the invitation, Mike, and pleased to join all those coaches out there who are as frustrated as I am that we're not actually trackside. I know. I wish we could be doing these type of interviews right before practice or right after practice. <laughs> sure, sure. Or in the rehydration place. Abs- yeah, exactly. That's that's exactly it. Uh, Peter, so it has been fascinating to get to talk with you over the last couple of days. I, I am honored that you would uh, join us to share your story. Uh, you've been involved in coaching track and field for 52 years, uh, not to give away your age, uh, or, or we like to say your experience uh, in this great sport. Why don't we start back as far back as you want to take us and talk to us about uh, your involvement in coaching athletics? Um, sure, Mike. I, I think that just a, a, a top-down overview is that I have, I have coached for 52 years, and basically half of that was in Europe, in UK primarily, and half of that's been in the US. So um, let me go back to, to starting as an athlete myself. So I started at 10 years of age as an athlete, and uh, I'll go up slowly year by year. No, no I won't. I'll, I'll, I'll skip through a lot of this. Uh, <laughs> Welcome to our first six-hour podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. So... Uh, no, I, I started at 10 years of age, and at that time, a uh, typical club system in the UK where the clubs went from uh, cradle to grave, and there was not much in the way of coaching in the clubs. It was a passing of wisdom down from the senior members. So there was nothing formal in the way of masters competitions there or, or youth, really. You just all ran together uh, in many of the, uh, the inter-club uh, competitions. And so I was never coached as an athlete myself. Um, and so it's kind of strange that, that when I was at university, I decided suddenly that, that others needed coaches. Um, and so I started coaching at a very young age. I started coaching before I was 20. So you were an athlete. You were born in the UK. You grew up over there. If, it, if anybody hasn't caught on from the accent, that's still there. Um, and then were an athlete, what events were you in? And then very interesting to what you just said there, how did that translate into coaching when you yourself didn't have coaches? Um, Yeah, so primarily uh, we started with the Harrier tradition, cross country. And from the cross country at that time, um, in, in league competition, our clubs needed us to do whatever we could do. And and uh, at that time, I was also the, the gymnastics captain of my high school. And so I would do the 5,000 meters and then run over and do the pole vault um, on an aluminum pole, going back to the aluminum poles. And uh, then maybe high hurdle and then come and do an 800. And you, you would do whatever was necessary for the team to, to get points. And so there was a wide kind of variety of, uh, of events and never being coached. I never had a, a particular focus, but... Um, 
I had a, a, a limb length discrepancy I found out much later between my right and left leg. And if you're running around the track, it's better to have your left leg slightly shorter. And unfortunately, my right leg was slightly shorter. And so um, I was great at running uh, cross country because um, of the, the asymmetry didn't matter so much. And I also um, orienteered, um, orienteering as most people would know, I think, or have heard about Scandinavian competition where um, you run over various kind of country open, could be open country or foresty uh, country, but you have a map and you go from point to point and the route you select is completely up to you. So orienteering is a, <clears throat> they call it the thought sport. So uh, cunning running, it's uh, running, but actually needing to make decisions. And obviously if you run too hard, your fatigue can cause you to make bad decisions. So anyway, I was, I always wanted to be a better athlete, a runner, but I was actually better at orienteering than I was at, at running. And I was um, in the top, top group in the nationals in, uh, in orienteering, but so anyway, I, I then got injured and, and decided, uh, although I could still keep running, uh, that I was never, I realized that the, the level of mediocrity I achieved um, was done without help of anybody else. And uh, I recognized I probably wasn't going to be world class, um, but perhaps I could help others to be, have a, a better experience than I had. I love the description of the clubs over in the UK. I, I was... Uh really stunned when I learned about this and I didn't learn about it until I started coaching college track and field. We had a young man from overseas from the UK uh, that came through the club system, as you described, uh, Michael Green. He's now the professor of maybe biomechanics or biology at Troy University where, where he was. He was a 5K kid, uh, you know, 14, 12, 14, 10. You know, he was, he was solid. Uh, but I remember him describing growing up through the club system and how he used to triple jump uh, he threw the shot put a little bit, and he um, basically said that doing those kind of activities growing up helped him to become a better distance runner because he wasn't just running miles or just hairier and things like that. He actually had to use other parts of his body and become an athlete. So I, I love that uh, mentality of the club system uh, in, in overseas versus here where in the American culture we are very single sport. Uh, and single event uh, oriented here where, you know, a kid shows uh, a little bit of pole vault savvy in sixth grade. And well, then all of a sudden all he or she can do uh, is pole vault for the rest of their life, which I think limits their athletic capability. So that's, that's awesome. I love hearing that example. Um, so interesting that you were able to, at that age, still a young age to understand that even though you had gotten up to a certain level that, you maybe could have gotten to a little bit higher level, maybe not elite level, but a higher level of performance if you'd have had some formalized coaching. So you decided to maybe go that route and become that that formalized coach. Yeah, very much so. I mean, uh, I, I retained my membership of my home club and went to university and I, I ran for the University of London. But um, you've got to recognize that collegiate running in the UK is very, very different. Uh, there are no paid coaches. Um, we appoint our own committees amongst the students. We organize our own travel, our own competition. Uh, everything is organized. There's a lot of taking on of responsibility and accountability by the students, which I, I really enjoy. And um, coming up to more recent times and what comes out later, but I, I work with Oxford University and that system is still happening now where um, as a coach to Oxford University, the head coach, I had nothing to do other than to coach. Uh, there's no recruiting, there's no uh, administrative work uh, other than preparing the, the programs for the athletes. And so very, very different from the collegiate structure in the US and they both have strengths and weaknesses. And um, so when I'm going back to when I ran for the University of London, um, that was a, a great experience. But again, I, I could have been coached there if I wanted to be, but, but chose not to be. I, I chose to um, use various groups of athletes to, to, to do my quality work. And, and that worked out kind of pretty well. Um, but like I say, I probably, if I had been coached from a young age, I probably would have either given up earlier or um, improved. I don't know. Um, but regardless, having not been coached myself, I suddenly decided that other people really need this. 
See, I, I can tell how much of a realist you are because most people would have just said, I could have been better. You also made sure to, uh, the real the realty of it uh, is that I also could have quit it much earlier <laughs> right, right. as well. Yeah. So what were you what did you decide to study at the University of London uh, academically? Well, uh, back in those days, and we're talking about way, way, way back in the last century, um, you know, almost a stone age. Uh, at that time, you could not get in the UK a degree in physical education or any sports science because they just didn't exist. And I had a very good teacher who who knew this. And he also knew that there was a change coming, that when I went to university, by the time I finished university, they were starting to do the first postgraduate certificates in education for people to transfer from degrees into teaching because the government realized we needed more people with degrees in the teaching profession. So they made a formal pathway. So I actually studied geology is what I studied at the University of London. And geology, one of the benefits of studying geology is you're aware of uh, the long time it takes for many processes to take effect. And so as a coach, you become very patient. You know, it's uh, when you talk about glacial progress, then you really know what glacial progress is. Um, so anyway, I, I did geology and then I, I went to uh, do my postgraduate work and that was the uh, the first year that that happened. And uh, I had a small number of people on this course. I think there were 15 of us, um, but that included people like Brendan Foster, who went on to set a world record in the 3000 meters and uh, get a bronze medal in the 10,000 at the 76 Olympics. So had some very good quality people um, studying with me and I was able to uh, those were really the first times I got up close at the University of London and my post-collegiate work was when I really got close to athletes of international caliber and, and realized that they are different animals. Both male the, and male. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I think some people think that it, it's just linear <laughs> to, to go from the, the eighth grade all-comer meet to the Olympics. It's just a linear progression and some just get higher than others. And it's a totally different, uh, it's a different animal, different species. <laughs> yeah, very much so, very much so. So take us through as you started getting into more coaching and some of the things that you've done, you've had a really wide, varied uh, career, which is uh, one of the reasons we wanted to have you on here, because it's just so interesting, the different aspects that you've been involved in uh, with all events for track and field, not just distance. Well, when, when you start coaching, you tend to kind of coach in the UK with what you have. And um, probably all but about 10 coaches in the UK um, were coaching just within their club. It was almost considered heresy to coach outside your club. Um, but myself and people like Frank Horwell, who established the British Miners Club, we actually coached um, across a variety of clubs. And so I had a lot of um, athletes from over West Sussex, where I grew up, and East Sussex and London. So I had a squad in the south of England. And all of those clubs that those athletes came from were, were, were happy with it because the arrangement I had with the athletes was if they left their club and joined mine, I would no longer coach them. And so that, that kind of gave the reassurance to the other clubs that, that they would be safe. And so I had sprinters, hurdlers, jumps and relays primarily because that's what I had. And I think we talked about Mike a little bit that one of the very early athletes I had was a, a young man called Daly Thompson. Now, for some of us who don't know who Daly Thompson is, first of all, shame on you. Go do some uh, studying of the history, especially of the decathlon. We just had a couple of great decathlon podcast episodes, so we should know more about that. Uh, but tell us who Daly uh, was and is. So Daly was a two-time Olympic champion in uh, 1980, 1984 in the decathlon. Um, he set the world record three times as a junior, five times as a senior. He won the European Championships, uh, I think, four times. He won the Commonwealth Games three times. He won the inaugural World Championships and then the next one, which was four years later, as it was a four year cycle then. So he won in 93 and 97 and uh, he had a long career and I could see as a young athlete, he, he was the most exciting athlete I've ever 
worked with in terms of um, having the physical skills to answer any physical kind of challenge. And uh, when I first worked with him, he was primarily a sprinter and uh, I introduced him to the other events because I could see these abilities within him. And uh, he won the national schools 200 and when he was 16, he won the national under 19 indoor 260 meters. So he was, um, I actually think he could have been a world-class sprinter, but he also was excellent. He excelled at all these other events. What was, I can't remember, was he a fairly tall guy? Um, not particularly, not particularly. When you, when you, when you look back in that time period, you had the Germans, uh, Siggy Benz and Jürgen Hinson, and Jürgen Hinson kind of towered over him. So he was, he was compact and powerful and, when he was younger, he actually took the 1500 more seriously. By the time he had got really good, he actually uh, preferred not to kind of challenge himself in the 1500. And I think that's one of the primary differences between he and Ashton. Is Ashton, um, Harry Maher has done an incredible job with Ashton Eaton, did an incredible job with Ashton Eaton, and, and, and didn't leave any weak points in his decathlon at all. And so if necessary, if it came down to doing something special in the 1500, then Ashton could do that. Yeah, we talked about you know Harry Mara real well. You actually, uh, spoiler alert, Peter lives in Eugene, Oregon now uh, as the uh, performance director for the Spirit of Oregon um, uh, uh, club there. Uh, one of the things that Harry talked about for that 1500 meters was how you're always competing for something. So it always means something, whether it's near, you got to be near your PR or not. Uh, Cause it was, you know, are you qualifying for the Olympic games next year with your score because of the 15 and things like that. Uh, but we also know many, many, many decathletes, you, Mike. many athletes who can, uh, uh, who just abhor the 1500. Yeah, so as a young athlete, Daly um, was was very good at the uh, 1500. But then, as I say, as he developed as a decathlete and he put a little bit more muscle tissue on, he was a very springy, a very powerful athlete. Um, the 1500 became less important to him because he usually uh, ramped up his points early on in the event. And so in major championships, usually by the time he got to 1500, it was in cruise mode and and uh, he would sometimes take that pretty easily. <laughs> I, uh, I can understand after nine events. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So who else were you working with? You talked about sprints and hurdles and relays at that time? Uh, sprints, hurdles, jumps and relays. And so um, just to, to back up on that a little bit in terms of um, coach education. So how did I come from this person who'd never been coached to be a coach? And so many... Uh, athletes who become coaches tend to either uh, mimic their coach that they were coached by if they like that person or do the complete opposite if they if they didn't like that person so um, that you tend as a, a, a coach coming into coaching to coach as you yourself were coached um, but I didn't have that so I didn't have either have that benefit or that, uh, that screen, that filter. So I was able to kind of start at that time in the UK, we had 13 national coaches. The national coaches were responsible for a geographical area in the country, developing all track and field in that area. That was a third of their time. A third of their time was involved in coaching themselves a single event, and they were national event group for high jump or pole vault or whatever. And then uh, a third of their time was involved in coach education. So they had to, and I think that was really, really excellent that we had the very, very best coaches in the country uh, involved. And they would hold a, a summer school uh, for two weeks. Um, and all the national coaches would be there. And they would run three or four different courses, a teacher's course, um, a beginning coaching course, and then a lot of advanced senior coaching courses. And all of the courses would come together once a day to kind of have a, a keynote address. And then all of the courses twice a day, we would have um, in, once in the morning, once in the afternoon, a one hour demonstration by some international athlete of their event. 
And so I say, you know, this is where you get up close and personal with people who are international champions. And so it's tremendously different. Was this closed, meaning was this just for UK coaches? Correct, correct. The, um, uh, well, I say that. It, we had several coaches come in from around the Commonwealth and, and take part as well. But that wasn't kind of sought after. It was primarily because it, it always sold out in, in terms of numbers. They had to limit the numbers. But I can remember we'd have uh, coaches there from South Africa or from Kenya, and, uh, and many of them had studied um, in our colleges of um, physical education like Loughborough and Carnegie. These are the famous kind of schools of physical education. So the coaches who came from abroad usually had had some link with the UK prior to coming into the courses. So at that time, um, you know, America has been a pretty good track country for a while. No U.S. coaches were coming in to teach at that point? To teach? No. Hmm. No, it was the delivery was uh, our national coaches because um, and the, the people we had were incredibly um, charismatic coaches, uh, competent professional coaches, really experienced um, and exciting to be around and to learn from. And so you've got to remember there was no internet then. There was no, um, Europe was probably quite different in terms of coaching practice from the U.S. And, you know, whilst we respected U.S. coaches, the, there wasn't that easy exchange of travel and information that we, that we have now. Um, yeah, that's a good, that's a really good point. That's, um, that's why I wondered if it was closed at first in that sense. Uh, but also cause it does remind me of the USATF coaching education program. When you talked about in the summer coming together for weeks or, you know, a week at a time on the level two. So I was just thinking of the comparisons, uh, of that. Uh, and at this time, is your role more of student at this time? Because, you know, we're going to talk about your role in coaching education, uh, throughout the throughout the world, really. But at this point, are you more student? Um, so each year I, I went for four years in a row and did a, a different event group uh, at the senior level each year. And then at that time in the UK, you could not become a senior coach, the very top level of coaching, until you were 25 years of age. And so three weeks after my 25th birthday, I got my first senior coaching award. And... I think you've got to remember that the USATF course now is only a matter of, I think, four or five days at the most. And these um, UK coaching courses were for two weeks. So Mm. there was an extensive time and you'd you'd spend lots of time in uh, darkened rooms using an analyzing projector because there was was no computer stuff. You would use these specto analyzing projectors, looking at 16 millimeter film and um, stopping. You you had to be skilled enough as a coach, Mike, to stop the film so you could see what was happening. But if you held it in place too long, then the bulb burnt through the film. You just lost half our audience with a projector and the uh, 16 millimeter. They got no idea. They're like, wait a minute. Why didn't you just use your uh, your iPad uh, m- movie maker? <laughs> right, right, right. Precisely. And, your uh, dart fish. And <laughs> hey, when we first started, we had those books where you flip the pages and you had the stick figures move that way. Yeah. Hey, uh, you know, over here, Duncan Atwood kind of yes. started that. And they're still amazing. I love those books. Those were those were that was high tech. <laughs> high tech. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, so how did you So this was all over the UK? When do you come to the States? What age and what brought you over here to this way? So I, ca- I came to the U.S. first in 73 because I, I knew I wanted to study in the U.S. And so, well, in North America. So I looked at McGill University, um, mainly because it had uh, Gill in the title. Um, <laughs> it's our favorite college. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> get some product placement in there. <laughs> so I, I went to McGill University in Montreal because the Olympics were about to be in, in Montreal. And so I thought, well, that would be a good place to study. So I looked at McGill, I looked at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, I looked at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, and then I came down to the University of Oregon in Eugene because I'd heard great things about Oregon. Um, 
I came to Oregon. I met a chap called Jeff Hollister at the athletic department, the Nike store, and uh, we hit it off straight away. And I started importing some Nikes back to the UK uh, when I got back home. And then in, in 76, I came over to do my master's in biomechanics at the University of Oregon. So I was in the US then from 76 until 90. And were you doing any coaching when you first came over? Or was it all uh, education? Um, I came over to do my master's in one year and I was not going to be distracted. I was not going to coach and I was going to do that one year and then get back to the athletes in, in, in the UK. And so I came and within three months of arriving, um, Tom Heinen had persuaded me to work with the University of Oregon women. And so I coached the sprints, hurdles, jumps, relays, and one of the 1500 meter runners for the University of Oregon women. And then because in Europe I'd coached both men and women, I also um, worked with Bill Dellinger. He had me as an assistant coach um, working with the male steeplechasers on the technique. And so uh, that was a kind of an exciting time because the second year there was the first year we gave scholarships at the University of Oregon for women. Yeah, this is really early in the collegiate development of women athletics. Definitely, definitely. And... Uh, interesting fascinating that, that 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 was going on and i also recognized that the u.s had no formal coach education structure at that time so what year was this when you started realizing that 76 77 and i'd started uh, mike back in the uk just before i left so in 74 75 i was actually starting to deliver uh, coach education courses in the uk under the uk system and uh, and this is the fascinating part for me, it, you know, I, as a coach, you know, I coached for 10 years before I came to this side, coaching education through the USATF organization was, uh, you know, I consider it vital to my development as a coach. So anytime uh, we start talking about coaching education, it's, a, it's sort of interest for me personally, uh, as well as, you know, there's, I mean, thousands, I almost said hundreds, there's thousands of people out there that have gained so much from uh, really the teachings of other coaches. That's what's uh, so fascinating about it. So start uh, transitioning there. It seems like it's the right time in your career path here that you start getting involved in USA. I, mean, I guess back then actually it wasn't even USATF. It was TAC, uh, coaching education. Well, yes. I mean, I've, I, I always valued coach education from my own experience, and I always wanted to give something back. But it always was – subordinate to my own actual coaching. So coaching was the, was the main thrust for myself. And at that time, uh, when I left Oregon, um, I coached, I was the administrator and coach to Oregon Track Club. And then Athletics West was formed. And a lot of the athletes I coached were recruited by Athletics West and moved into that program. And so through the 80s, um, I worked with a lot of very, very high quality athletes. Um, right up until 1990 when I left. And so coaching was the main activity and coach education was something which I felt it important to make time for as well. And there was a really, uh, I feel very privileged for the group of people who were involved in coach education initiatives at that time. I mean, Vern Gambetta was a, an amazing driving force and coordinated and brought together the first um, coach education founding committee in 82 and so there's myself and Gary Winkler and Lawrence Seagrave and Joe V Hill and Joe Rogers um, holy cow who were on this on this committee which yes formed the the TAC uh, coach education program which started in in 82 I mean you could have just named like the Mount Rushmore of coaches and coaches education right there Yes, yes, it was it was very good. And I think uh, for myself, I'm less known in the U.S. because I was here until 1990 and then I worked for a 20 year period with the IAAF and then uh, came back here in 2011. So that there isn't the continuity of exposure. And so a lot of people um, internationally are aware of the work I've done, but but not so much um, in the U.S. And, and 
that that's not an issue at all. But you were involved on this groundwork of what became level one, and I assume also then became level two. I don't know the time frame of how the development of levels came through. Yeah, no, level one first, and um, I helped to kind of bring that to fruition, but Vern Gambetta was the driving force. He was the one who really, um, he was the one who, who, who led the train, and Joe V. Hill wrote a lot of the endurance material, so I should back up and say that, you know, after I left Oregon coaching there, I, I started focusing 100% on my main interest in in track and field, which is 800 meters to marathon. And so um, that's my primary interest. But I was involved in delivering the, the first endurance courses at level two and helping to write that with Joe V. Hill. And then also worked with Lauren Seagrave and, and we delivered together the sprints and hurdles. So I had sufficient background in that to be able to do that. So this is a question I've always wanted to ask. And I've met a lot of those individuals. You know, Gary is just one of the top people in the whole wide world, Joe V. Hill, Joe Rogers, Vern and Lauren. Lauren taught my level one back in the day. I mean, just great people. And I've never asked them this. So I'm going to ask you when you guys, I, I envision you guys being in a basement, you know, by candlelight and writing these things out. I'm sure it wasn't as uh, gritty as that, but you were laying the groundwork on some really fundamental education initiatives for the, you know, I say American college system or American uh, track system, coaching system, but I know it's reached uh, way out of, outside of our borders. But my question to you, as someone who is one of these people, did you guys have any inkling of the impact that you guys were on the ground level of developing at that point? I, I think so, because we'd seen what had taken place in other places, you know, around the world. In, in Australia, they instigated quite a solid program in the uh, late 50s, early 60s. If you go back to the United Kingdom, they had their national coaching structures and, and um, educational structures in place in the 50s, going back to Jeff Dyson and people like that. Um, so I think that we were able to kind of learn a lot from, from other places, but also we had the benefit uh, of an immense number of very, very high quality universities in the U.S. who were able to contribute some of the kind of cutting edge information in various areas like physiology. So I think we were in a very good position that, that we could learn um, from others. Um, People like Victor Lopez was doing great work in the, the North American, Central American, Caribbean area very early on. And so, you know, there, there, were, there were people around the world. Um, we have to look at the U.S. in the context that there are 213 member federations of the IAAF, now World Athletics, that, that, that the U.S., um, we tend, what well, we've got great strengths, but one of perhaps our weaknesses is that we tend to be a little parochial in our view or, or lacking in, in, in experience in our view and, and assuming that if this is the case in the US, then that's the case globally. And, and we're so blessed with things like facilities that we have in the US. Um, most countries don't even begin to approach uh, the facilities that the US has. And so I, I think that Though that group coming together, we we were people who were pretty aware of what was needed in the U.S. and and felt that would benefit the coaches and the development of coaches. But also we were aware, very aware of what was happening elsewhere in the world and, and drawing on that where it was appropriate. And do you know, uh, I don't know how much you've kept up with USATF coach and education on the level one and level two side. Uh, and I guess now even because I think they've bridged something with world athletics, maybe level five and uh, way above my knowledge level. I, I did a few, several of the level twos, but I never got past that. But my question is, is what we are doing right now in, in USATF coaches education, is that what you guys thought of as you were building it from the ground up or has it completely morphed into something maybe a little bit more radically different? It, it probably hasn't changed as much as it could have changed. Um, I still deliver level one courses. I do two or three courses a year for USATF. And um, 
I don't have the time for the to, to do the level two courses, but um, I know what's happening there. And as far as the level three courses, the USATF level three is the IWF Academy course, which used to be a level five, but it's the IWF Academy course. And so if you if you do that course, then you automatically get a USATF level three. Um, so we have a good system in place, but it's still very much a knowledge based system. Um, whereas globally in 2000, um, I introduced initially in the UK, um, the first competence based system. So it's not about what you know, it's how you do your coaching. So it's actually unpicking a lot more. What are the basic coaching skills? What are the, the skills of communication? What are the skills of, of um, providing instruction, explanation, providing a demonstration, providing feedback, observing and analyzing, actually unpicking those and creating environments where the coaches become a lot more internally reflective. And they think about after a session, how the session went with regards to the athletes, but in many places around the world now, the coach will also reflect on their coaching practice. And so they'll think, you know, what did I do that was good in that session? And, and I definitely uh, want to get to that. And I definitely want to get to that component. There's two components we're going to make sure we talk about that you're, you're hinting at one of them. Uh, and the other one, I don't want to give away yet. But before we get there, uh, pause that and catch us up to speed. We're kind of up to 2000. I think you said you went back to the UK in 2000. Catch us up to speed here in the 21st century of what you've been doing coaching wise. So in 1990, I went back to the UK and started working with the IAAF. And I put into place a three level program for the IAAF in seven different languages globally. And uh, that was kind of a, a fun activity, a real challenge. So uh, I came back. Um, I revisited that in 2007 and we put in place a five level system with the IAAF, which again, which was in seven languages and, and implemented globally. So just the big picture from uh, 1990 to 2010 was during that period, I was largely working with the IAAF, consulting with them, either working full time for them or consulting with them. And um, at the same time, I think it's important, Mike, that I, I've always maintained my coaching, um, so I never switched to coach education and stopped coaching. I've, I've always coached. Um, sometimes my job demanded that I coach a uh, slightly lower level of athletes, maybe national level rather than international level, uh, just because of time commitments. But um, I've always felt that it's important that if you're going to be involved in coach education, if you're going to actually be able to update yourself and to innovate, then you actually need to be at the coal face doing the activity. Yeah, you have your your career as it relates to coaching and coaching education is the real uh, coach's coach, uh, not just someone who has uh, moved on to just teach courses, which there's value in that. There are uh, tons of, of really, really smart uh, now former coaches who help teach coaches on uh, a technique and things like that. Uh, and then there's the other side where coaches who are just happy to coach and they don't want to get into any kind of formalized teaching. You have really bridged that gap of the teacher coach slash coach teacher. Um, I hope so, Mike. I mean, you might say that I couldn't possibly comment. Well, your career comments, that's the important part about it. Uh, so as you've gone through with your uh, current coaching, uh, let's start talking about something that you brought up in one of our pre-interviews that I found really fascinating. Um, I want to be, able to be able to have you say it in your words. So I'm going to uh, try to hint at it to make sure you remember what we talked about, that, that we're on the same wavelength. You talked about the ways coaches uh, receive their data to to coach, whether it's uh, evidence based or practice based. And you have a real philosophy about that. Can you help us understand your take on that? Well, I think we've got to recognize that coaching these days involves a lot more than just the coach. The coach has also got to 
um, if they're working in many professional fields, they're going to be working with colleagues who are support colleagues. And so it's how you interface that all together. And uh, what I find is that the physiologist or the physical therapist, the young physical therapist or physiologist, um, tends to, by their mere age, not to have experience of practice, but they've got a lot of their information from research. And so that it's research and they, and they consider that as evidence. And so if you go to high level programs around the world, they, they say, they're very proud to say that we're introducing evidence-based practice. Now, evidence-based practice, when they talk about that, they mean putting into place what research has told us. And actually, research is pretty poor for providing a lot of the evidence that the coaches have, because research by its very nature is usually a, a very short intervention and so you don't get any linear long-term look at what's happening. Whereas as coaches, we're working with athletes over three, four, five, seven, nine years. And so it's the incremental changes that take place and what you have to do as a coach. And so I talk about um, practice-based evidence. So I use evidence for what I do as a coach, but it's come from my practice as a coach. And I'm continually reading um, research. Uh, I go to original research. I don't read textbooks because they're merely um, a synthesis of, of, of research and you don't know how well that's been done. Whereas I always start from, from first principles research. And over the years, I've found a lot of things which have explained why what I do works. Um, but my experience internationally as a coach is that there has never been any effective coaching practice which has come initially out of research. Uh, research allows us to perhaps better understand the structures and processes involved and it can give hints about how why things have worked and possibly hints about how we can make it better but in terms of um, with the younger coaches and with the physiologists and the physical therapists, I really urge them to, to practice, practice, practice and to experiment in themselves in their practice and get this empirical, really valuable information. So it's not so much about coaching being evidence based practice of research evidence, but being practice based evidence where the evidence you're using is the evidence that this works. And as a coach, and the athlete, at the end of the day, you're not really concerned about why it happens, but the fact it happens. So your take is that the evidence, the research, because it is much more of a uh, short term, you allow it to support your coaching that is more long term. You use the term linear. You're, you have an athlete over a uh, year and years, uh, depending on how long you have the athlete. You allow that research to support how you coach an athlete, not let it drive the way you coach an athlete. Yes, I think that's a very good way to put it, Mike. Only, uh, rather than support, I would say, yes, it supports in the way of adding clarity. So it, it gives some clarity to, to what we're doing and, and why it works. And then, so for example, with lactate dynamics training, I introduced that term in 1995. And yet I've been using that type of work from 1975, from when I listened to Brendan Foster talking about uh, running against the Kenyans. And he would say, you know, when I'm running with the Kenyans and we're in a pack, it's really annoying because one minute you're tripping over yourself and the next minute you're being extended. And then suddenly the pace has subtly slowed again. And, and what the Kenyans are doing is, is running naturally, you know, kind of the, in, in terms of rhythm, running rhythm, or any any rhythm really, it it there's a natural ebb and flow. Um, I remember Paul Simon going to record Graceland in South Africa, and he was really frustrated because Western musicians you could do ten takes and splice any bit of those together to make a, a whole. And Paul Simon said it's really frustrating. But in South Africa we've got these great musicians, but every time they play it, they play it slightly differently, and so it was difficult to kind of. Uh, to cut and paste um, different parts of the music together. And so uh, 
an athlete who performs well in any event will have a natural rhythm and within that natural rhythm there is there is an ebb and flow of energy that takes place um so i did i from 1975 on i would have athletes rather than say running 68 seconds for a 400 i would have them run at that time the straights at 66 and the bends at 70. so they're ebbing and flowing and that was a contrived way of doing it. I do it a lot more naturally now, but it wasn't until 1995 when I was in the University of Washington Medical Library doing some research that I found um, this work by George Brooks and George Brooks proposed the lactate shuttle and uh, the lactate shuttle explained what was happening, that, that, that I'd been taught like most coaches had that lactic acid was a bad thing and, and here was Brooks saying, no, lactic acid as such does not exist in the body. Uh, you've got the hydrogen ions, you've got the lactate, and the hydrogen ions are the bad, bad guys, and the lactate actually helped to provide energy to the, uh, to the system. So it helped explain why what I was doing was effective. And, and so that, that's where I really value science. You know, I, I value science, but I don't use it to lead me. I use it to help unpick what, what's happening so that's interesting. There's this, um, I don't want to call it a meme, but there's this photo going around the uh, Facebook right now amongst track coaches. Uh, I can't remember the two individuals. I want to say, and I'm sure I'm going to get them wrong. One was Peter Snell, and I can't remember the other person. I'm terrible. It's two half milers, super stud, like 141 type half milers, right? I mean, just brilliant. And the context of this photo is that the one 141 142 half miler never ran less than eight miles a day and then the other one the 141 142 guy never ran something like longer than five miles or something like that so basically two equal athletes in the sense of their time but radically different on how they got there what you explained kind of sounds like that individualization side of it. Because in a, in a research, it's all very sterile and it's all based on one path. But we know in reality, when you're coaching athletes, th there's many paths because of how the athlete is made up. No, I think you're right, Mike. I think that uh, when you look at a, a young coach, a beginner coach, they're, they're always looking for a method. And like I said earlier, that when you start coaching, you tend to use the method tend to be like your style tends to be like the way you were coached yourself. Um, but a, a more experienced coach has a method. And then you can say if they continue kind of developing uh, an even more experienced coach has a variety of methods at their disposal that they can apply to the individual in front of them. So it's not a, a one size fits all. And so I've had athletes who uh, have improved dramatically by reducing mileage and doing more specificity. And I've had athletes who have improved dramatically by um, they had certain qualities already and, and just increasing the volume of their training. So it, it's there's not just one direction. It's trying to look at the strengths and weaknesses of the athlete you have in front of you and then saying, now, now how can this individual um, develop themselves? And if you're going to, uh, if you're a high school aged kid going to rate run in college, if you don't believe that the coach that you're going to understands that, well, then you better interview that coach and find out, do they coach the way you have developed? Because if you're that eight mile a day plus kid and you go to a coach that says, oh yeah, you're never going to run more than 30 minutes. Well, that's going to be counterproductive to how you developed <laughs> up to this point anyway. I should say it has the potential to be counterproductive because right. it's still, you're right. Yeah, yeah. See, I caught myself there. I, I... <laughs> <laughs> nice catch, Mike. Nice catch. Because, yes, if you take Kenny Moore, Kenny Moore trained uh, way too hard in high school. And Bill Bowerman used to limit him when he came into Oregon. And he said, you know, kind of all the track team and the people that Bill Bowerman knew around town were, were, were told that if they saw Kenny running when he shouldn't be, to, to feed back. And so Kenny was immensely frustrated and he writes about this in the Men of Oregon book. And yet he came out in the first meet and ran a massive PR in the two mile and uh, begrudgingly, I'm sure not begrudgingly, but he had to, to admit that, you know, kind of Bill Bauman perhaps 
did know a little bit more about what he needed as an athlete than he thought he needed himself. Right. right. Yeah. You know, what year was this for Kenny Moore? Uh, that would probably be in the 60s. Uh, and God bless. I can't imagine. No, coach yes, late 60s. Sorry. Late, late 60s. I can't imagine now where an athlete has every coach at his fingertip and every YouTube video and every person who thinks they know how to coach at their fingertips every minute to say, well, yeah, but this guy says I should be doing 100 miles per week. <laughs> right. Precisely. It, it, it's it's very difficult because uh, many athletes and many coaches um, don't filter they don't have the experience to filter what they're seeing. So YouTube is great, but my experience is the vast majority of material on, on YouTube is very, very questionable. And that's why I, I would always encourage people to go to the, the USATF courses or the USTF CCCA courses, um, go to recognized courses um, to, to get your qualifications and your information. Um, because at the end of the day, it shouldn't be about see this, copy that. It should be see your athlete, think what their needs are and create environments where you're you're fulfilling the needs of the athlete. Yeah, if you think anything is the be all end all, uh, specifically as relating to YouTube here, always remember you can find proof, and I'm doing air quotes here, uh, that the earth is flat on YouTube as well. So Remember, always uh, apply your thinking brain to what you're seeing. Don't just take it as, as gospel. Uh, Peter, so I talked about there was two things I really wanted to make sure uh, we heard uh, from you and your development. And one was that uh, evidence-based practice versus practice-based practice. Evidence. Uh, evidence. Okay, good. I knew I'd screw that up. The other was <laughs> the aspect of, uh, I believe you coined the term. Uh, See, that's how we know you're in Eugene, Oregon. You have ducks in your house. That's amazing, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> your loyalty to Eugene is amazing. <laughs> I, I shouldn't have kept the uh, patio door open. You know, people think <laughs> uh, Eugene, uh, Oregon will put out a picture of their steeplechase, their water barrier, and it'll have ducks in it. And people think it's staged. I'm like, no, that's that's just a, that's called Monday in Eugene. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Uh, on a more serious note, the other aspect that I wanted to talk to you about was this term that you coined uh, biokinetics, I believe it is. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, I, I've been working on um, elastic energy um, with athletes pretty much my whole coaching career from the beginning. But um, only recently in the final years have we begun to understand more um, about what's happening in the body. So I, I always admired the kangaroo because the kangaroo is the most elastic animal out. The uh, kangaroo... The faster it goes, the less metabolic energy it uses. Um, so it's using all of the elastic energy in, in its uh, hind legs, in the tendons, and the other structures involved. Um, when a kangaroo uses a five-point um, movement, so it uses its tail as well as its forelimbs, and it's very, very inefficient and, and uses a lot of metabolic energy. So when a kangaroo starts moving fast, it, it has this paradox of the faster it goes, actually, the, the less energy it uses. Um, so thinking about kangaroos and thinking about other things, I started doing a lot of research in 2016 into... Um, the latest information on stresses and strains and tissues involved in elastic movement in the human body. And there'd been a sudden change in equipment whereby we could measure through ultrasonography, we could measure the actual stresses and strains in tissues in the living body. And so prior to that time, most of the work on uh, tissues had used cadavers and not unsurprisingly, cadavers are not very elastic creatures. Um, so, <laughs> so we we didn't have a very good understanding of of what structures were involved and 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 how they were involved. So this ultrasonography helped to really help us understand that the the role and place of the tendons, and then also another tissue which I won't go into, and I won't even mention the the word aponeurosis because aponeurosis is something which in in 
15, 20 years time, coaches will trip that off their tongue just like they do ligament or tendon or bone or whatever. But aponeurosis is uh, much of the material we talk about as fascia, which goes around the muscles and around the tendons. And the plantar fascia is in fact a plantar aponeurosis. It's a, and and, and the, the point about these uh, materials is that tendons are only uniaxial. They can store and return energy in one direction. Whereas the aponeuroses are multi-axial, they can um, absorb and return energy in, in multi-directional. And so we're getting a much better understanding about what the muscle is actually doing and what these other support tissues are doing as well. And so because uh, to think about it simply, the more elastic energy you have, the less metabolic energy you need to use to move at a certain speed. Or here's the added value. For the same metabolic energy, if you've got a lot of biokinetic energy, it allows you to go faster for the same metabolic energy. So it's an add-on. It's like thinking in terms of a hybrid car. And you've got these three metabolic systems on one side, and you've got your battery-powered add-on Tesla kind of boost on the other side. And so um, the, 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 the whole point about this is athletes and coaches have known about this for a long, long time, but they haven't really been able to unpick what structure is involved, what we should be doing uh, in terms of training to develop biokinetic energy, and not just in running, but in all events, because we now know, we, I'm proposing that the shortening cycle that we've taught in the past, in fact, is a very dated model based on what we knew then. And there's actually three different models now that the, the muscle tendon aponeurosis unit so we used to talk about muscle tendon unit now we've got to think in terms of muscle tendon aponeurosis unit this mtau actually behaves differently when we're running when we're moving our center of mass at a constant level over the ground it behaves differently when we're accelerating so when we're or jumping when we're raising the center of mass and it behaves differently when we're lowering the center of mass so like when you're coming into a long jump land so the, the, we, we've got a much more refined way of understanding what is happening in the body rather than the old simplistic stretch shortening cycle. So it sounds like I'm going to try to re-say this back. It sounds like we, we knew something was going on on the track as we were coaching. It went to the researchers, and at this this point, they're finding out the actual, and I'm not even going to try to say that name, the ap, aponeurosis. I guess I am going to try it, aponeurosis. Yeah, uh, and, na- and now the goal, so that was in the lab. That's the research. Now the goal is to come back to the practice and uh, find out the best ways to improve those aponeurosis activities to improve the event. Yes, I mean, I, I think that the research didn't lead again. It's something which coaches have, have done plyometric type or um, So the implications of developing biokinetic abilities are that you need to develop this thing called stiffness of the kinetic chain. And the stiffness is, if you like, the squashability. And so if you're running on a soft surface, your kinetic chain is going to be stiffer than if you're running on a hard surface. On a hard surface, your kinetic chain is going to adapt and become softer. And so these challenges to the kinetic chain need to be put into the training. You need to run on a whole variety of surfaces, which is um, counterintuitive to I want my athletes always to run on a soft surface so it, it, it helps to prevent them from injury. Well, actually, I'm not sure there's really tremendous evidence of that there's a lot more practice-based evidence that i've had athletes where variety so running uh, a mixture of trails and grass and blacktop and cement uh, learning the skill of running on cement you know that not huge amounts but but a variety all the time and um, what personality so what percentage would you say for each of those and i said well I wouldn't because the percentage should vary from week to week and from day to day, from session to session maybe. And so we also need to bring in undulating terrain. And in Eugene, I think a lot of the athletes train too much on, on flat surfaces. On uh, We've got these wonderful trail systems which are all flat and trail and wood chip trail. 
And I don't think that helps to develop the biokinetic qualities as much as uh, running over raw terrain um, forces you to uh, adjust your stiffness as you're going up and adjust your stiffness as you're coming down. And so the more adaptable the stiffness is, the better you're going to have um, developed your biomedic abilities. And so if you look at athletes like Mo Farah and Galen Rupp and Jordan Hasse, why did they improve as much as they did? Well, much of that came from um, some metabolic improvements, and a lot of it came from the, the, the work to improve their biokinetics. Um, they are incredibly, uh, or have become incredibly elastic individuals. In, you had mentioned uh, a few minutes back, you said when people ask you, well, how much should you be doing? You said it would change, you know, from week to week and session to session. Would it also change athlete to athlete? No, um, because uh, pretty much every athlete, if you're going to develop the ability to have a skilled, adaptable kinetic chain, you need to provide the environments that are going to help develop that. Now, what is true, Mike, and there are individual differences in how much natural biokinetic energy they will have. And so back in the 70s and the early 80s with the British Milers Club, if we had uh, training weekends, we would test the athletes, the men and the women, the boys and girls, by hopping 25 meters. And they would hop 25 meters on their right leg and then hop 25 meters on their left leg. They would repeat that two times more, and that helped identify asymmetries and also helped identify abilities because generally um, top quality male milers would do 11 hops and top quality women would do 13 hops. And so you'd look for somewhere in that region. Um, is it a showstopper? No, because we had an athlete there who was the British cross-country champion and she was uh, 17 on one leg and 19 on the other leg and she was um, still a, a very good 3,000 meter runner um, but I worked with her for two years to develop um, these biokinetic abilities and uh, after two years in the world championships she was uh, fit in 3,000 and I, I believe she should have been second because there were three Chinese in front of her but um, Sonia O'Sullivan uh, was in that race, and, and this athlete uh, improved. And when we retested, she was uh, equal on both legs and probably somewhere in the region of 14, if I remember correctly. Well, Peter, uh, you know, I am the wrong person to continue these type of conversations. Uh, but what is amazing to me uh, is this level of, again, this, this real amalgamation of research and coaching. Uh, and as for someone who was on the ground floor building uh, our USATF coaches education, which built upon our now USTF CCCA education as well, uh, I truly believe without one, we wouldn't have the other. Uh, and for a guy whose coaching career was radically changed, mine, personal, uh, through that, and I'm it, there's a long line in front and behind of me of people who would uh, have the same um uh, experience. I want to thank you for the, I don't want to overstate it and say millions, but definitely millions when you consider the number of coaches that the system that you built with such greats as V Hill and Gary and, and uh, Vern and Lauren, those coaches helped beget other coaches who helped beget tons of athletes. So, but on behalf of uh, anybody who will accept it, man, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. I, I do give coaching education, uh, a huge amount of credit for the success I was able to have. So thank you so much for what you were on the ground floor uh, building. Well, thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, kind of, I, I should also point out that I think all of us who do that at the higher level, one of the reasons we do it is by talking to others and explaining it actually helps our own understanding and we get insights by going through it that way, because normally when we're coaching, we don't necessarily have the time to kind of think about that. But when you're discussing with colleagues or you're presenting materials, you'll suddenly get that aha moment. And it, it's so it gives selfishly, it gives us that time to do that. So hopefully it's kind of a, a, a double benefit. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, and that's why I think things like the USTF CCA convention 
uh, is so valuable because it gets a lot of coaches together and they don't have to worry about coaching. Uh, they're in their downtime before season starts, uh, as well as, uh, again, I have to make this plug for the coaches collab group on Facebook. Uh, that might be one of the just greatest assets that I have seen in the last few years for, again, coaches coming together and helping each other, learning from each other. Uh, I, I think there's a huge asset to that. So it's great to hear from your side on on the level that you are at a much, you know, much more educational um, research and application method to hear that. That's awesome. Uh, so as we wrap this up, Peter, I would like to take it back to your coaching side. Uh, who are you excited about? What kind of uh, athletes are you working with? And uh, I know 2020 is a, is a bust, but what's uh, maybe uh, around the table in 2021 for some of your athletes? Well, for the athletes I'm working with now, uh, our foundation doesn't have the finances to support uh, the, the higher level that we had before. So if anybody's listening to this and wants to support a high level group in Eugene, Oregon, then uh, please contact me. Um, what I am doing is to work with uh, both collegiate coaches, high school coaches, middle school coaches and athletes working what I'm doing now is more and more creating situations where I'm trying to develop the competence of the athlete and the coach synchronously. So um, helping to develop the coach through the athlete, helping to develop the athlete through the coach and through my interventions. And that's been tremendous fun. And all through my, my coach education, I've always kept in contact with um, the post-collegiate athletes, the professional athletes and coach them. Um, most of my career has been working with athletes at that level, but I've also um, experienced collegiate coaching and maintaining that interest of high school and, and middle school. So I think it's looking at the, at the needs across the board there. Um, so the future holds for me, I think, Mike, probably more and more work with coaches and athletes. We, we do this program down in South Lake Tahoe where we have a, a, a camp there and it's a unique camp where the athletes come in, but the athletes can't come in unless they ha are accompanied by their coach. And so we have the coach and the athletes together and, and we work together in different environments and um, it, 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 it's incredible fun. And it's incredibly fun for me to see, at see coaches um, begin to realize that they haven't probably looked at their practice of coaching by stepping outside and looking at what they're doing. They're, they're so busy doing what they're doing, they, they don't necessarily think now as a professional or as a coach, even though I'm doing this as an avocation, how do I make my coaching better? So I pretty much try and wake up every morning saying, um, what can I do today to move my coaching forward? I'm so glad we have people like you thinking about that as their future. Uh, you know, we talk about weak chains in an athlete, you know, if they're not strong enough or their hamstrings or their, uh, their fitness levels, things like that, we tend to forget. Uh, and we even talk about it on the coaching side, right? If you're, if you're not doing, uh, if you're not learning things like that, but we tend to forget that whole body of coach and athlete. And if there's a weak chain between those two people or the group of people and a coach that, you know, problems and not, not even just problems, but you can't even reach your highest peak that you you would might be able to physically hit if if there is that weak chain there. So I really do appreciate that that is your your future and that that's your daily wake up. I, I love that. That's that really is inspirational, to be honest with you, as I look towards what I do, not as a coach, but in the business world of supporting coaches for track and field, waking up every day with that thought of, OK, how can we improve that ecosystem? I, I love that. Uh, I will ask you one final question, and it's about your future. Um, you are just fascinating, Mr. Peter. I love you to death. Uh, and there is a whole other aspect to your career, your passion, uh, that involves ethics as it relates to track and field. My question for the future is, will you promise right here, it's recorded, you know that, <laughs> will you promise to come back one day to the Gill Athletics Connections podcast and let's talk about your role in ethics as it relates to athletics and how important uh, ethics is to coaching track and field? I'd be very pleased to, Mike. Happy anytime. Man, that that is the best way I can end this podcast right here. So thank you so much, Peter, for joining us. Uh, I can't say thank you enough. Uh, 
how can someone reach out to you if they want to uh, maybe there's some high level stuff you talked about, so they don't need to be reaching out to me. Uh, what might be the best route for someone to reach you? Um, probably right now through uh, Facebook Messenger and, and I'm on that Coaches Collab uh, program, also on the uh, NACAC uh, TFCCA Virtual Congress um, page. And uh, yeah, people can reach out through that and uh, I'd like to thank you for having me. Absolutely. I'm going to plug that Coaches Collab group one more time. If you want to reach Peter, go to Facebook, search Coaches Collab join that group. You got two questions. Marissa always makes sure that I remind people answer those two questions or she won't let you in. Once you're in that group, then you can message Peter and trust me, you will not regret it. Uh, this has been just a wonderful enriching time for me, Peter. So thank you so much for being here today. Well, guys, that's it for today. Certainly hope you received as much value from this episode as we did making it. Uh, if you've made it this far, really appreciate you joining us. Your time and attention are super valuable, and we certainly don't take that lightly. Uh, and we also don't take lightly your feedback. Would you consider leaving us a rating or a comment in the app that you are using right now to listen to this episode? That would be really valuable for us. We'd really appreciate that. Uh, Want to know when future episodes of the podcast are available? The best way is to subscribe to the podcast in this exact same app. Right now, go hit that subscribe button. In the meantime, if this episode of the Gale Athletics Connections podcast provided you with value, would you consider giving that value to others in your network, sharing this episode and other episodes on your Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, smoke signals, whatever way you would like to do it. We'd really appreciate you sharing with your network and spreading the value. That's it. Really appreciate you. Can't wait to join you next time for another episode of the Gale Athletics Connections podcast.